as a staff, we talked about the, the name for this series a little bit. And I was talking, like, it was originally going to call, be called Reconnected, the idea that we would reestablish uh, relationships in our lives. But then as we talked about it and I thought about it, I thought, I don't know that we've ever truly connected well in the first place. To be able to reconnect implies, implies that we, we initially had great relationships with people where we were open. We were able to talk about things that were spiritual in nature. And, and I don't know that we've ever truly had that because our society is so surface level. We live most of our relationships out on social media. And I don't think that's what God desires from us. In fact, uh, I, think, I think if you're going to follow Jesus well, you're going to have better relationships. I mean, if you're really going to take his word seriously, you're going to have better relationships than you can imagine, but it's going to be challenging. I think, I think we should take what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16 to heart, where he says, do everything that you do in love. That we would move close to people intentionally in an absolutely loving way. And so in this series, what we're going to do is we're going to explore some of the things that keep us from making real true connections with other people. Where we can love them past some of the difficulties and the frustrations and the annoyances and the, the quirks that make us want to stay it back. But we can actually move towards them and say, I believe God wants me to be a person who genuinely loves people past the surface. Loves people to the point where I, I want to be with them. I want to be around them. I want to be open and close and connected. And so we're going to start out with what I think is like the number one roadblock to real true relationships. The number one thing that keeps us from honestly connecting with people in our lives. And, and, and you might hear it and think this doesn't apply to me. I, I want you to hear it and hear it as if maybe it does, but you just don't see it. Maybe this is there, but you just don't see it very well yet. And so here it is, that we would stop passing judgment on other people. That we would stop passing judgment. Our text that we're going to look at this morning is in Romans chapter 14. And i got to kind of fill you in on some of the history uh, of the church of Rome. And I'm going to do my best to do that in a way that doesn't take the whole morning. Uh, but So the church of Rome um, is founded with two different groups of, of followers of Jesus Christ. There were those who were Jewish by heritage, and so they came to believe that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, but they had a whole, attached to that, a whole way of living, a whole system of, of what they did throughout the day, and it went so far as to how they prepared food and what food they ate. And then you had a group of people who came to know Jesus that were out of what was called a Gentile, or basically just a non-Jewish background, and they had no such foundation. And so the Church of Rome, you have both of these very different backgrounds and very different opinions, very different ways of handling even things as little as, as food entirely differently. And they're supposed to get along and they're supposed to connect. And so that's the idea in a church is that we would connect and we would do something, we would accomplish something that God designs us to do and we would accomplish it together because what we do together is far better than what we can do individually. But what happened is specifically that issue of food in the Church of Rome became a huge deal. Now, food is a big deal to me if you know me. In fact, it was my birthday last week and somebody just brought me bacon this morning. And I, like, if that doesn't get you bonus points around here, I don't know what does, but that was awesome. But food had become the dividing factor in their congregation. And the reason why is because there was food that was available at, at a discount price in their society. And what it was was there, there were different religions who would, they would sacrifice animals to, to their gods, and then they would take those animals and sell them in the marketplace for an absolutely bottom dollar price. And the Gentile Christians, the non-Jewish Christians would say, well, that meat is worth, you know, what a way to save money and be good stewards of the money that God has given us. And, but then you had the Jewish customs who, were, and they were saying that you couldn't possibly think that that food which was connected to those practices was okay to eat. And look, we're not going to get into Paul's actual working through the message. What I want to see is his message of how judgment was the greater issue. That whether or not they ate or didn't eat meat was far, far less important to the way that they interacted with each other, the way they connected with one another. And so read with me in Romans chapter 14 um, and in verse 10 where he says, he says this. He says, You then, 
Why do you judge your brother or sister? Because keep in mind, they're saying, this person is ridiculous. I don't want anything to do with them because of the food they eat. So he says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each one of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Let's pray as we consider this impact on us and the relationships that we have day to day. Our Father God, we ask that this morning that you would help and guide us in life. Lord, I think each and every one of us wants to leave this world having loved people as well as we possibly could have. In the end, your word instructs us how to do that. It instructs us how to live a life that's filled with sacrifice and filled with generosity so the people around us just feel blessed to be around us. Ultimately, that's a reflection of your love as you gave your son in a sacrifice and in generosity for us that whoever believes in him gets to live forever with you after they die. Father, I pray that your sacrifice and your generosity would encourage us to likewise make similar sacrifices in our own lives out of love. In your name we pray. Amen. So here's the thing. What's happening here is, as we're going to talk about judgment, again, I reference this. I think the reality is every one of us will either say, yeah, I, I do that, or no, I don't really do that. I don't think I do. I'm asking just for this morning that you give the benefit of the doubt that you probably do judge people and maybe just don't realize it. That maybe it's there and you're just not fully aware of it. Because if you consider what was said here, this is, this is a humbling text. This is a challenging thing for us to think of, for us to move away from thinking about others in a way that, that distances them or punishes them in our lives where we just we don't want to be around them as much because of what they've done or because of who they are. And what Paul says here is, is he goes, look, you guys are fighting to the point where you don't want to be around each other. And, and I want you to understand something. Your theology doesn't match your relationships. What you believe to be true of God does not, does not make sense. If you fill out the implications, the way that you treat each other doesn't match with your theology. He, he's going, here's, here's the reality. We know that God, as much as he is loving, is also a judge. And every human being in this earth will give an account. And so then that's the theology and then the practicality, which wasn't matching up with that, is, is he's going, so if that's the case, then why do you feel obligated to judge somebody else? Why do you feel entitled to judge somebody else? Why do we even feel justified to judge somebody else? He says, think about it. Like, God's already got this. And if he judges then you and I, we don't have to. And think about the dynamics of that for a second. That you can now enter into a relationship with another human being where they can do things that are maybe wrong or harmful, and you can say, I'm still going to love you because there's a God who loves you. There's a God who cares about you, and there's a God who will judge that. And I can look at you as if I don't have to be the one to bring about judgment because God does. Look, do you remember when you were just first learning how to drive and you went with your parents in the car? Do you remember like, like you're in the driver's side and they're sitting in the, driver, the passenger side next to you and every little thing that you're doing, they're, they're pointing it out and it's wrong. And I get that, that when you're first learning to drive, that's a helpful thing. I, I remember being mad at my dad, but my dad was giving me helpful things like you can't look at the herd of the deer and drive, or herd of deer and drive at the same time. Like that honestly was advice my dad gave me about 15 times. Um, and, and I remember being frustrated, but okay, I was kind of used to it. But if I went for a drive right now, or if you went for a drive right now, and somebody sat in the back seat and spoke to you the way that you were spoken to when you first started to drive, and they, they commented on everything else, you'd say, hey, I don't need a backseat driver, right? You'd say, I got this. I drive this way to work all the time. I, I've driven on the road for many, many miles. You know, I, maybe you even drive professionally. I don't need a backseat driver. Paul writes the church in Rome, and he says, when you judge other people, you are behaving as God's backseat driver. 
You're trying to do his job. And Paul goes, you don't have to. You don't have to judge anybody else because there is a judge. And he doesn't need you correcting how he handles life. He doesn't need you interrupting how he's working in somebody else's life to try to judge them. He's got it. He doesn't need you sitting in the back seat and saying, look, I, I, do you see what they're doing? Can you imagine that? Look, look at this. Uh, you, to point that out is you being the role, playing the role as God's backseat driver. Here's, here's why I think this is challenging for us to let go of. Because I think there's a part of us that gets hurt when other people do things towards us that we're offended by or we, we take personally. I think there's a part of us that gets offended by that. And, and we feel like it, it's almost a subtle subconscious, I'm going to get even by judging you. Like, I, I might not, like, physically hurt you, but I'm just going to look down on you. The word that he uses is contempt. Contempt is to look down upon, to look at as if they are less. And, and I think what's going on here is Paul's going, look, you don't have to play this role anymore. And he's inviting you to do something that is incredibly freeing for you interpersonally. He's saying that you can rest in God's promise that he'll be the judge. We can be people who love, he'll be the judge. Uh, did you see the way that he spoke about what God said he's going to do when he'll judge everybody? He, he, Jesus says in that statement, as surely as I live. He gives a guarantee here. He guarantees that he will play the role as judge. Promises it that you and I can rest in that and say, I'm free to not have to play a role that I was not designed to play. That I can move forward in, in, in loving people freely without having to judge them. As surely as I live. That's a promise. And that's a promise to those of us who have been hurt by somebody. And God says, as surely as I live, I will judge them. That's a promise to those of us who have been held back in life because of somebody else's behavior. As surely as I live, I'll judge them. That's a promise to us, to those of us who've moved close to other people and, and have gotten hurt, and instead of staying there, we've moved away from them because we've judged them, we don't want to be there anymore, and we're afraid of being hurt again. And God says, as surely as I live, I will judge. And so then what Paul does is he moves on, and he says, this is, this is then how you live. You get to remove judgment, which has been a stumbling block to other people. In his mind, Judging others is making them trip up in their lives. When you judge others, it becomes a stumbling block for them. You think about this, and, and I find this to be a dynamic that, that intrigues me, but, but we always... Well, well let, me ask, let me ask you this. Have you ever had somebody judge you? Has somebody ever judged you? Has that stuck with you, or was that just a moment thing that you forgot about and you never thought about ever again? typically speaking, if you're like most people, that hangs with you. And then you spend time trying to guard your reputation or try to resurrect your image in a way that is not true. Because judgments hang with you. Now, here's, here's the question. If, if it hurts you that much and hangs with you that much, why would it affect the people that we judge any less? Why would it be any different towards them? The way that we view them and look down upon them, why would it hurt them less than it hurts us? It doesn't. And so our judgments carry just as much weight as those judgments which are against us. I once was speaking with a counselor about this, um, and, and I was looking for advice about how to, how to help teach people this concept. And, and she says, what you have to understand is you've got to get, and this is her speaking from her counseling perspective. She says, I have to establish that, I, I, that the people that I work with, if I'm doing couples counseling, they play by the same rules. And if you think that those words would hurt you, then you have to understand that likewise they would hurt them. And so judgment is a stumbling block, and we know that because personally, we've been on the receiving side of that frustration. Likewise, if we play by the same rules, we understand that judgment is significantly destructive in somebody else's life as well. 
There's a theologian named Douglas Moo, and, and he writes about this, and, and he talks about how the reality is, even though this issue that originally brought it up was about food and, and how their faith led them to different choices and what they ate or didn't eat, he says, look, the text assumes that differences like this aren't going anywhere. They're not going to disappear. They're not going to vanish. The more that we as a church grow and the more that we have people from different backgrounds and different life experiences coming together, these issues aren't going to go anywhere. And judging others in a way that looks down upon them and tries to harm them or keep them distant from us is just as painful to them as it would be to you. You know, here's, here's the thing. What Paul is basically saying is we're going to have our differences Let's just not let them become destructive. Let's not let them tear down. Because if you think about it, judgment is destructive. Because what judgment does is judgment offers to make a conclusion about somebody else. You're concluding something in a way that brings finality to who they are. This is why when somebody, somebody offends you or somebody wrongs you, you'll often make statements like, I don't know why, I don't know why I was surprised by that, because I know he is this. Or this is what she always does. She's that type of person. Of course they did it. That's who they are. Judgment offers a conclusion, and it brings a finality, and that's where it becomes destructive, because none of us want to be permanently labeled as anything. We don't need to speak with finality over anyone, especially When you've got the God of all creation who says, as surely as I live, every knee will bow before me. I don't have to be the backseat driver. God's got this, and I'm going to trust him. What he says is, he says, make up your minds not to be a stumbling block for somebody else. That you bring finality not to somebody else and and who they are or what they're going to do or how they always are, but you bring finality not to them but to you. He says, make up your mind that you would determine to be someone who isn't a stumbling block to others. This is just who I am. I don't care who they are. I care more about who I am. I'm going to be a person who loves somebody else, even if they have a different opinion than me, even if they do something that's different than what God wants for them, I'm still going to love them because I've made up my mind and I brought finality and a conclusion to who I am. I'm just going to be a person who's a a phrase that we use a lot around here, who's a source of grace. I'm going to freely love people even if they don't deserve it. That's who I am. You know, uh, a couple weeks ago, I had a farmer friend of mine invite, invite me and my family over, and he said, hey, I was thinking that our kids could play together, and uh, we'll set up the sprinkler, and we'll have fun. And what I didn't know before this that I learned afterwards was that farmers really know how to have fun. Like, they work really hard, and they don't get to have a lot of time for fun, so when they have fun, they have fun. And I went in mind with, like, a little, you know, Walmart sprinkler system, and I go there, and, and I show up, and, and my buddy, the farmer, says, hey, um, I'm going to head down to the barn and get the pump for the irrigation And if you could take the irrigation sprinkler over by the trampoline, and I've dug out a pond for the kids to play in for the day with the tractor, um, we're just going to have this big irrigation sprinkler over top of them. And I'm like, what? This is incredible. Like, he's basically setting up a water amusement park for my kids on his farm. This is amazing. And and I remember, uh, because we were getting it, hooking up to this, like, water pump that he uses to pump water on his, on his fields and he's like yeah last time last time we did this uh i actually sucked up a bunch of crayfish from the creek and at first i was like that could be dangerous but i thought that could be fun a sprinkler with crayfish shooting out at everybody that sounds awesome we could if we get enough we could have dinner we could just be a great time look it, here's <laughs> here's the thing my job my job as, as we set this up, my job was to make sure that the 500-yard hose didn't have any kinks in it. That was my job. So I go along and say, like, okay, here. Because even, even with all that power, even with all that, that suction coming up out of the creek, if there was one little kink in the hose, it shut the flow of water down. And so I walk along, and, and I'd, I'd undo it, and then the water flow would continue. 
Judgment is like a kink in the hose. God has designed you to show grace to other people, to show free, undeserved, unconditional love to other people, and judging others is a kink in the hose. And it interrupts the free flow of grace that God wants to push through you to the people that you work with, the ones that annoy you day in and day out, the ones who take advantage of you and are rude to you. It's, it's God's free grace to the, to the family members that frustrate you to the neighbors that don't do the things that you want to do. It's free grace. And our judgment puts a kink in the hose. And it stops the flow of love from God through us, to us, and to them. Look, I I need us to do something. I want us as a church to be a source of grace. One of our values is we're a source of grace, not drama. In order for us to do that, I need to be obsessed with who God has made me to be and not who somebody else is. God has made me to be somebody who sees not the best in others, but sees the opportunity for grace in others. I see it. No matter who they are or what they've done, they might have a lifestyle that's not what I want, not what God wants. I'm still going to love them. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Do everything you do in love. People who see others with the opportunity to demonstrate grace to them. Romans chapter 14, and he continues in verse 19. He says, let us therefore make every effort. Not like a little bit. Not like once in a while. Not when it's convenient. Let us make every effort to to do that which leads to peace and to mutual edification. And he uses a word edification that's the exact polar opposite of the idea of contempt and judgment because one is to tear down and the other is to build up. He says we should be people who look for opportunities to build people, not deconstruct them. Build them up, encourage them, not tear them down. That's who we are. He says don't judge others, determine who you are a source of grace to the people that God has in your life, that we would be a people who says, I I know that you probably do some things that I don't like. You're probably going to have some quirks that annoy me. You're probably going to do some things that that are immature relationally, and and they might offend me. I'm still going to love you. I've just decided I'm going to be a person who loves you in spite of that. Why? Because there's a God who judges And as surely as he lives, I can rest in his promise and I can be a person who is going to build others up and not tear them down. As I was thinking about this, there was one phrase that that came to my heart. Um, And it's this, "If if you are good at maximizing the sins of others and minimizing your own sins, relationships will always be a challenge. If you are good at maximizing the sins of others, and minimizing your own, relationships will always be a challenge. What Paul said in Romans 14, 19 was that we would lead to a path of peace. That when we're angry at someone, we'd say, how can I lead this to peace? How can I not maximize their sins and minimize my own, but how can I lead them to peace when I'm frustrated with somebody When I'm disappointed with someone, how can I lead them to peace in a way that restores and allows me to actually connect with people in our lives? I think that's really what our society wants. Connection beyond surface, which means I can't judge you and hold your wrongs against you in order to really love you. I was reading a book this week uh, by a guy named Justin Dean, and and his book is about how churches need to handle different things. And and he says this about why, why we need to have difficult conversations why i know it's easy for us to choose contempt and judgment over a conversation but this is what he says and i took it as a challenge for me personally to say matt i know that i am prone to want to just judge others think it in my head and stay a little bit distant from them because of it and i read this and god's going that's not what i called you to do that's not who i made you to be So this is what Justin Dean says. He says, we live in a world where people are scared or maybe too selfish. Huge, huge insight for me. Maybe too selfish to have real conversations as human beings. We'd rather be passive aggressive jerks than actually confront someone and work out our differences. Wow. 
Maybe, maybe we're scared or selfish in such a way that we're not, having, not willing to have real conversations to love people. This is what God calls us to. You got the church of Rome and they're going, I can't believe you eat that. And they're saying, I can't believe you don't. Have a conversation. Love each other through your differences and find a way to be non-combative in conversation to love people. Look, this is, this is what God's judgment urges us to. It, it compels us to. There's a God who was judged on the cross for our sin. There's a God who was judged on the cross for our sin. And so then the question is, do you have room in your heart for Jesus to have been in judge, judged in someone else's place? If you enjoy the judgment of God and you say, God, I thank, I'm thankful that my sin deserved, sin deserved death, but your son was judged for it. He paid that penalty. Then do you likewise have room in your heart to understand that someone else is a person that Jesus died for as well? That their sin can be covered by his cross. And it doesn't need my judgment because it's already been judged. What this is trying to do is to create some momentum in your life. That you become a person that shows more grace and more grace and more grace. Because you understand how it changes the dynamics of relationships. You see how it encourages and inspires people. You know, when I was a kid, I remember going over to, to my grandfather's house. And um, sometimes I would help out with different chores around the house. And, and there was always one chore which me and my brothers kind of wanted to do but didn't want to do because it was really dangerous but it was hard work and what i'm talking about is is, is this is going back 30 years now when when we didn't have riding mowers like we did today and we had the old push lawn mowers which is basically just a whole bunch of really sharp blades that you gotta you'd start pushing it, it was a death trap i mean I guarantee you, if you use that thing for more than a couple of years, you were going to lose a toe at some point because it's just spinning blades. And so me and my brothers were always like, no, I want to do that. That looks incredible. Like th there's, there's power behind that thing if you get it going. But that's the thing. You had to get it going. It was a mower where you couldn't just kind of walk slowly behind it. You had to get the momentum going and really keep it going. And that's what allowed it to cut grass. What Paul's saying in the book of Romans is, is that this judgment thing is, is killing the momentum of grace through your life. It stops it. It slows it down, and then you've got to start up again. Keep the momentum going. This is, God designed you to be a person who connects and loves other people. And to that, for that to happen, well, you've got to get some momentum of grace going. For you to lay down the, the idea that, hey, I'm just going to love you if you're not perfect. I might disagree with you. I might have a difference of opinion. I'm still going to love you. Even if you frustrate me, I'm going to love you. Because that's exactly who God is to us. It's been judged on the cross. And so every day that I sin... Every day I get a little short with my wife or my kids and, and maybe I'm angrier than I have to be to, to get my point across or maybe I just was lazy and harsh with my words instead of taking the time to, to be patient and communicate. I believe there's a God who forgives me. And I believe that because he died on the cross for sins like those. And his momentum of grace towards me does not slow down. And that we would be a people, we would be a church that says we're going to love people well. We're going to keep the momentum going and we're going to let go of the judgments of others for that to happen. I was thinking about this and I was thinking along the lines of God's desire to be with us. And you know what the cross was? The cross was because 33 years wasn't enough. The cross because Jesus becoming a man and living with us for 33 years didn't satisfy God. He didn't want 33 years. He wanted forever. He wanted the opportunity for us to enjoy his presence in a way that doesn't end. The cross was because 33 years wasn't enough. Let, let's have that be a motive for our relationships with others. It's just not enough time. I want to love you more. I want to love you beyond what I even have time for. And because of that, I want to be gracious and, con and considerate and merciful to you. Let's pray.
Our God and Father, I know there, there is within our hearts something that just feels good when we think bad of other people. It's just this little kind of hierarchy. And, and my mind goes back all the way back to elementary school where you'd pick on somebody else to make yourself feel a little bit better. And God, I think sometimes that happens even, even as adults in the whole realm of judgment. And I just ask that we would be a people who'd find such significance in your love and the fact that we were forgiven of that which we should have been judged for and that that would be our attitude, not a hierarchy of how can I feel better than somebody else, but rather how can I serve them? How can I behave as less so that they can feel like they're more? God, we ask that for your strength and your mercy in your son's name. Amen.